Spain, 1808. The British and her allies are fighting the French. This is an account of one man's experiences, his hopes and his fears. My father was a shepherd. And almost as soon as I could run, I began helping him tend to the flocks of sheep that filled the downs in Blandford and Dorsetshire, where I was born. I used to spend the long winter nights learning how to make shoes. I have no doubt that my life and that of my children would have continued in that exact self-same fashion had I not, in 1802, been drafted into the Army of Reserve. Now, I had no choice in the draft. The recruiting sergeant said I was a hardy young fellow, exactly the kind that he was looking for. My father did not have enough money to buy him off, so I was obliged to leave my father without a shepherding companion just when he was beginning to require one the most. For old age and infirmity were setting upon him, and his hair had become as white as the sleet on our downs, and his brow and countenance as furrowed as the fields all around. It is perhaps then just as well that I did not grieve over my fate. In fact, quite the opposite. I was struck at the bustling contrast to the quiet and tranquility of my former life. I could hardly keep back, had to be pulled physically from the ranks several times, and for that enthusiasm I was rewarded with a position in the light company. I was while on a recruiting drive with them in Dublin that I one day saw a corps of the dashing 95th Rifles. It has been said by officers of high rank that there never were such a set of devil-may-care fellows so completely up to their business as the 95th. All I knew was these were the most reckless set of men that I had ever beheld, and nothing would now serve me till I was a rifleman myself. I got my green jacket and my rifle in 1808. In that year, we were ordered to Portugal. It was in that year that I first saw the French. We are, I wish I could picture it now. Splendid sight of the shipping as we left the downs. Thousands of men on the boats, the sails given majestically to the winds, and amidst the cheers of our comrades, we set sail for hostile shores. And we arrived at Mondego Bay safely enough, little realizing what lay ahead of us, and the rifles were the first off of the boats. For we were always in the front in advance and the rear in retreat, first onto the field and last off it. And yet, and yet with a burning sun above our heads and our feet sinking, Every step into the hot sand, many of us soon began to find the misery of the load that we were condemned to march and fight under. The weight I toiled under was tremendous. I am convinced that many of our infantry sank and died under the sheer weight of their knapsacks alone. The full complement of things that I was expected to carry were more than enough to force a hardy fellow of five feet and six inches into the earth, more than enough to impede the free motions of a donkey. The battle began a few days later. I don't pretend to give an accurate description of this, nor indeed any battle that I have been present at. All I can do is say what happened immediately around me. I remember standing at the front of the other light companies and looking back toward the ranks, thinking that I would never again see such a splendid sight on all the earth. For there were our ranks of men, their bayonets glistening in the sun, their gazes fixed unalterably toward the enemy, and the colors flowing above our heads. Men and brothers together, about to begin the awful work of death. We advanced ahead in chain order. The rifles and the other light companies going first. Some of the rifles split off and began to work together in pairs, it was then that the French began their heavy fire upon us. The first man hit was, was Lieutenant Bunbury. He got a musket ball right between the eyes, went down and was dead before he hit the ground. Another soldier near me was struck in the thigh and also went down, and it was at that point that the rifles poured down a storm of leaden hail upon the enemy. 
and I was soon very hotly engaged, jumping up and running for it one minute and loading and firing the next. I had used my rifle so much, the barrel of it had become so hot that I could hardly bear to touch it. And the smoke that our weapons created filled the field, so I was occasionally obliged to dash it from my face to see what I was aiming at. Sergeant Fraser was hit hardest of all. He went down screaming. Froth pouring from his mouth, a perspiration cascaded down his face. I thank heaven he was soon out of pain. Musket ball. But I'd taken him sideways, see, and gone right through both groins. One of the boys, angry at the death of the sergeant, fixed his sword bayonet to the end of his rifle and ran forward toward the army all on his own. And without a single word passing between our lips, the whole of the skirmish line responded. We tore through the grass like wildfire, and the French, unable to bear the sight, turned around and fled. After my legs had exhausted the impetus of that charge, I noticed I was standing in long grass. Three dead Frenchmen lay amidst me. They had been plundered. Their avisacks having been torn open, the contents lay scattered on the ground. Amongst other things, a small quantity of biscuit crumbs in a tin had lain at my feet. But the sight of, of three ghastly bodies had failed in even making the slightest impression upon me. But the biscuits! <laughs> well, the biscuits I thought a blessed windfall. And ignoring the taste of the dried blood inside the tin. I devoured them ravenously. It was after the battle that we marched out of Portugal altogether and on into Spain, where we joined the army under the command of Sir John Moore. And it was then, not through his fault, that things began to go against us. Larger armies were sent to deal with our small one. Our Spanish allies were outnumbered and surrounded. And there was nothing for it but to go back, to retreat to the safety of the coast and the protection of the British fleet. Our marches were now much more arduous than before, up to 42 miles a day. Hard enough for the men, their faces now ragged with beards of many days' growth, but harder still on the women and the children and the wives and the families that struggled along with us. Our shoes and boots had now been destroyed by the foul roads that we were forced to travel, so that many of our party were now entirely barefoot. Their feet were sore and bleeding, and the sinews in their legs ached as if they would burst. And still we carried on. We were now in the mountains. The snow were falling fast. The hills became slippery. And many of our party slipped and fell on the treacherous ice, and being too weak to rise again, gave up and died where they lay. Many sinking with fatigue reeled as if in a state of drunkenness, their arms useless to those that had them left. We could no longer help one another. It was now every man, woman, child for themselves and God for us all. I remember I remember passing a man and a woman. They were lying clasped in each other's arms dying together in the snow. Well, I knew them both. My man and wife. The man's name was Joseph. He belonged to the rifles. I saw them there. I knew them. I just left them. 
I just left them there to die together. I walked past, using my rifle to aid walking, stumbling and limping toward the beach. By the time that I had reached the shore, I was the last of our party to do so. And now being too weak to call out, I lifted my rifle, put my shackle upon its top, and signaled for the boats to return, to come back, so that I might leave everything that I had seen behind me. Lieutenant Cox turned that boat around and he dragged me from the water like an infant child. I could not believe it. I could not believe that I still drew breath. The inhabitants of Portsmouth were horror-stricken to see the state of their men and their women returning, pallid, wayworn, crushed. Some said beaten. No. No, never beaten. But we went back into Portugal, and then on into Spain, and then to France, where the enemy was to learn the power of this weapon, and learn that a British soldier is never to be beaten. For the fields of death and slaughter are by no means bad places in which to judge the hearts of men, especially especially riflemen.